for inviting me for this task. Although I am not a person of the field of which he was leading light. Friends, as you know, Nani Palkhiwala was a leading lawyer and an expert on taxation and budgetary matters. But to my mind, his biggest contribution was in upholding the Indian Constitution. Sometimes I think that had it not been for the people like him, the basic structure of our Constitution would have been different by now. Mr. Suresh Prabhu on the subject, putting India on fast track. Professor Indra Rajaraman on the subject, decoding the Reserve Bank of India, Government of India relationship. Honorable Mrs. Nirmala Sitaraman on the subject, Roadmap to Five Trillion Dollar Economy. May I request uh, the Minister for Finance and Corporate Affairs, Mrs. Nirmala Sitaraman, to release the book. Nana Moy Adishir Palkiwala was born on 16th January 1920, the second of three children. His surname, like many Parsi surnames, was based on the business carried on by his ancestors. The Palkiwalas manufactured palkis or palanquins. His parents, Adirshir and Shiru, were a devoted couple. A later day edition of Palkiwala's classic commentary, The Law and Practice of Income Tax, was dedicated to the memory of his parents with these memorable words. To the memory of my father and mother. So now in the end, if this the least be good, if any deed be done, if any fire burn in the imperfect page, the praise be thine. If ever a colossus strode across the Indian legal arena, it was Nani Palkiwala. After a brilliant academic career, he quickly became one of India's most sought-after lawyers and remained at center stage for five decades. Famous for his phenomenal power of concentration and persuasive advocacy, he was a supremely successful lawyer. Palkiwala Foundation was conceived in the year 2003 after the demise of the legendary lawyer Palkiwala. A few like-minded professionals in Chennai who were regular in attending his famous budget speeches got together and decided to form a trust to perpetuate the memory of late Nani Palkiwala. The main objective of the trust is to conduct public lectures on subjects covering various issues of national and public importance. Palkiwala had a great regard for the intelligentsia of Madras, as Chennai was then called, and had mentioned this more than once in his budget speeches. The Trust has been conducting these lectures since February 2003, when it was formally inaugurated by Mr. A. Sivasailam, and the first inaugural lecture was delivered by Mr. Soli Swarabji. We present you this short clip on some of the activities of the Foundation.
It was aptly said that in those days there were two budget speeches. speeches. <laughs> One by the finance minister, <laughs> another by Nani Parkiwala. <laughs> and Nani Parkiwala's speech was undoubtedly the more popular and more sought after. The members of the Governing Council of Palkiwala Foundation are Mr. K. Parasaran, Mr. S. Ram, Dr. S. Badrinath, Mr. N. Murali and Mr. N. Rangachari. The trustees of the Palkiwala Foundation are Mr. S. Mahalingam, Managing Trustee, Mr. R. Anand, Mr. Arvind P. Datar, Mr. V. Ranganathan, Mr. N. L. Raja, Mr. V. S. Jayakumar, and Mr. K. Balaji. Just after the demise of Palkiwala in December 2002, a condolence meeting was held in Hotel Palm Grove where all the followers and well-wishers of Mr. Palkiwala got together to pay homage to the departed soul. This resulted in sowing the seed for creation of a trust by name Palkiwala Foundation. Palkiwala Foundation set up the Palkiwala Center on Constitutional Law and Public Law in collaboration with the University of Madras. Ram Jethmalani on the subject, the judicial system need for urgent reforms and uniform civil code. Mr. Raghuram G. Rajan on the subject Mindset to Succeed in a Globally Competitive Economy. Mr. Yashwan Sinha on the subject Fiscal Governance and Budget 2005. Dr. Jayaprakash Narayan on the subject First World People and Third World Politics. Dr. Kiran Bedi on the subject, the challenges before Indian policing the way ahead.
you can now sir ladies and gentlemen just give us a couple of more minutes we are waiting for some more participants to log in we will start the event in another 2 3 minutes time go back there nana boy adishir palkiwala was born on 16th january 1920 the second of three children his surname like many parsi surnames was based on the business carried on by his ancestors the palkiwalas manufactured palkis or palanquins his parents adarshi and shiru were a devoted couple a later day edition of palkiwalas classic commentary the law on practice of income tax was dedicated to the memory of his parents with these memorable words to the memory of my father and mother so now in the end if this the least be good if any deed be done if any fire burn in the imperfect page the praise be thine if ever a colossus strode across the indian legal arena it was nani palkiwala after a brilliant academic career he quickly became one of india's most sought after lawyers and remained at center stage for five decades famous for his phenomenal power of concentration and persuasive advocacy he was a supremely successful lawyer palkiwala foundation was conceived in the year 2003 after the demise of the legendary lawyer palkiwala a few like minded professionals in chennai who were regular in attending his famous budget speeches got together and decided to form a trust to perpetuate the memory of late nani palkiwala the main objective of the trust is to conduct public lectures on subjects covering various issues of national and public importance palkiwala had a great regard for the intelligentsia of madras as chennai was then called and had mentioned this more than once in his budget speeches the trust has been conducting these lectures since february 2003 when it was formally inaugurated by mr e sivasailam and the first inaugural lecture was delivered by mr soli swarab ji we present you this short clip on some of the activities of the foundation live good evening ladies and gentlemen welcome to the 40th palkiwala memorial lecture conducted by the palkiwala foundation chennai i now request mr anand trusty palkiwala foundation to deliver the welcome address ladies and gentlemen on behalf of the trustees and the governing council members of palkiwala foundation i have immense pleasure in welcoming you all to the 40th nani palkiwala memorial lecture to be delivered by none other than the world renowned author and global investor ruchir sharma thank you ruchir for accepting our invitation to deliver this lecture palkiwala foundation was started in february 2003 by a few like minded individuals to perpetuate the memory of one of the best lawyers india ever produced the main objective was to conduct periodic lectures to the public at large on topics of national importance this we have been doing from 2003 to date in 2005 the foundation promoted nani palkiwala arbitration center to offer an institutional framework for alternate dispute resolution mechanism a long felt need for our country it was a matter of strange coincidence that my first call with ruchir took place when i was in kunur in october and he was in miami i am emphasizing kunur for the simple reason that a very little known but substantive fact is that ruchir was born a couple of kilometers away in wellington in the nilgiris district though he is based in the united states for over two decades now and seen as an outsider 
his heart is totally in india and his soul is in tamil nadu where he was born ruchir is now rated among the top 5 thinkers of the world he is a prolific writer with clear and sharp points of view backed up by intelligent assimilation of data this has made him one of the most successful global investors handling at one point of time 20 billion dollar us dollar assets under his management his best selling books are the rise and fall of nations 10 rules of successful nations breakout nations and democracy on the road each one of these books are standout best sellers and are used as reference points for several decisions in various countries to write his book on democracy on the road ruchir was literally on the road for months in several parts of india covering various aspects of the lok sabha and the state elections in short ladies and gentlemen ruchir walks the talk now coming to the subject for the day the subject is apt and extremely contextual the post pandemic world it has varied economic and social implications but it is not my intention to steal the thunder and take away even one extra second of time that has been allotted to ruchi but i only want to make one point to set the context and put matters in proper perspective 2022 is poised to be a watershed year in the history of global economic landscape and i say this because it is firmly believed that for the first time ladies and gentlemen and i repeat for the first time the world gdp is set to cross 100 trillion us dollars a century is a landmark to be applauded both in cricketing parlance as well as for macroeconomics india gdp for the current year is estimated at 3.1 trillion usd the legendary palkiwala in whose memory we are having this lecture today died in 2002 when the global gdp was 52 trillion usd he would have been the happiest man to welcome the milestone of 100 trillion usd gdp for the simple reason that even back in 1970s and 1980s when we were all students listening to his budget lectures he truly believed in free market economy and more importantly the entire world as one economic village ladies and gentlemen it is now up to ruchir sharma to take us through the changing dynamics of the world and the disruptions to economic and social models caused by the recent pandemic this event is going worldwide and i welcome you all once again to what i really want to refer to as a virtual treat before i hand over the lecture session to ruchir sharma i just wanted to narrate the flow of the program ruchir sharma will speak for about 30 minutes that will be followed by a question answer session moderated by ranganathan and mahalingam trustees of the foundation and finally there will be concluding remarks and vote of thanks by arvind datar trustee may I now request ruchir sharma to deliver the 40th Nani Palkiwala Memorial Lecture. Over to Ruchir, please. Hi, Sanand. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. A uh, real delight to do this. Uh, we all grew up, obviously, um, hearing Mr. Palkiwala's name, his legendary speeches uh, post the budget. Uh, so in that uh, vein, I'm delighted to do this, even though I'm a bit reluctant uh, giving lectures, uh, so to speak. But I, I think that the, um, uh, you and I had a long discussion about what this lecture should be titled. Um, I think that you were very keen that I should use the word disruption uh, in my, in my, um, in my uh, title. And I was reluctant to do that. I was reluctant to do that because of one simple reason, uh, that if you look at this, crisis, this pandemic, it is very distinctive in one way, that most crises in the past, even if you go back to the global financial crisis of 2008, 
most crises in the past, what they ended up doing was turn the world upside down, which is that the world was going in a particular direction, a crisis comes along, and then uh, the world looks pretty different once the crisis has passed. What I find remarkable about the pandemic, and uh, this is especially true in economic terms, is that this crisis has not disrupted the world as much. Of course, it has disrupted it in a literal way, but what's even more significant, I, I feel, is that the crisis has accelerated many of the trends that were already underway before the crisis began. And that's something which is going to be the overarching theme of my talk today, particularly how it relates to India, because that obviously matters to us most for, and most of the audience that's tuning in uh, for this talk. So what do I mean by that? So if you look at this crisis, uh, the very nature of this crisis has been such where it has accelerated many of the trends that were already underway before the pandemic broke out in early 2020. And there were some trends which you would have expected to have been overturned and uh, for reasons that are still uh, somewhat mysterious, this crisis has accelerated those tr uh, trends as well rather than have uh, overturned them. So what do I mean by that? There are really four big trends that were defining the world before the uh, pandemic broke out in early 2020. And I'm talking here mostly in economic terms. What were those four trends? Those four trends were, had to do with uh, declining demographics, declining productivity, debt increasing, and also deglobalization. These were, so to speak, the four Ds that were defining the world before the pandemic broke out in 2020. More than two years later, what I find is that all these trends have been accelerated in some way or the other by the uh, pandemic. And so let's look at it uh, in terms of how that's happened and put this in historical perspective. So take the one about demographics. Um, it's, a, it's a factor which I feel is dramatically underestimated in terms of how it influences the global economy. There's a lot of interest in the topic, but I think its impact is underestimated and especially so uh, in a place like India. So I'm gonna give some historical perspective out here, which is that uh, if you look at the demographic trends of the world, um, like for the last thousand years or so, the world's population was increasing at a very, very slow pace, uh, at a rate of less than uh, half a percent a year, right up until the, uh, uh, the 18th century. Then in the 19th century, we had the first uh, industrial revolution and the world's population growth rate picked up from half a percent a year to around 1% a year. And then after the second world war, the world's population growth truly exploded. It started growing at uh, over 2% a year. And it averaged around 2% a year right up on, uh, until uh, the 2000s. Now, why does this matter from a global economic standpoint? Because if you look at it from a global economic standpoint, there are two drivers of economic growth. One driver of economic growth is the number of people who come to work. And the second driver is how productive these people are when they come to work. So what is the increase in the labor force? What is uh, the increase in productivity? These are the two factors which drive economic growth. And in this regard, it's very important to see that the global economy's growth rate has been very heavily influenced by the number of, uh, people come into the workforce, which in turn is influenced by the population growth rate. So this is where I feel that uh, some of the changes have not been properly appreciated. That the global economy after the second world war grew at a pace of nearly 4% a year, 
never in the history of mankind had the global economy grown at a pace which was so rapid. Uh, the data which goes back even after the uh, first industrial revolution, the global economy's growth rate did pick up, but it never got anywhere close to 4% a year. Now, it's very important to understand why did this happen after the Second World War? This happened after the Second World War because of the fact that the population growth rate around the world went up significantly. And of course, you also had an increase in productivity, but it was in equal measure an increase in the world's population growth and also an increase in productivity. But an increase in the world's population growth rate was a very important factor as to why the global economy grew at a pace of more of nearly 4% from uh, the 1950s onwards, a pace that it had never grown uh, at uh, such a pace in the past. But here's what happens, which is that in the 2000s, somewhere in the mid 2000s, the world's working age population growth rate, the one that matters most for driving economic growth rate, began to, fa uh, began to fall. Uh, and that was a very important reason why, even though people thought it was all about the global financial crisis, but why in the 2010s, the global economy growth rate kept coming down, that across the world, it was very difficult for countries to grow at the same pace that they were growing in the 1990s or in the 2000s. The case of the economic miracles, the countries growing very rapidly at 7 or 8%, those cases virtually disappeared in the 2010s. So there was a big demographic shift that was underway. The massive baby boom, which took place after the end of the uh, Second World War, uh, that big baby boom came to an end. Um, as women were having fewer babies, uh, with much, you know, uh, greater uh, sort of education, much uh, uh, in terms of the uh, change in lifestyle and habits, the number of babies being produced reduced very significantly. So I think that this is a very important point for us to understand that the demographics of the world were changing. The big boom that took place in birth rates and in population from the 1950s onwards, had started to come to an end by the end of the 2000s, the entire decade of 2010s, the world's working age population growth rate was declining. And then comes the pandemic, uh, that we have the pandemic, most people would have thought intuitively that given the pandemic, people being forced to remain indoors, we will end up having uh, an increase in birth rates. Ted, what the data shows is that the birth rates in most countries have dropped significantly during the pandemic, something which is still being analyzed uh, and something which is still, uh, 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 you know, people are still uh, sifting through the data and coming to grips with it. But what it means, not now, these are very long leads and lags uh, that the birth rates decline now. Uh, the impact on the working age population defined as people between 15 and 64. The lag is quite significant. But what's very important here to understand is that because of this, you will end up getting uh, a phase here uh, in the next few years where the uh, working age population growth rate is going to be even lower than what we have today. So this I think has uh, like very significant implications for economic growth rate. And let's look at it, what exactly does this mean for India? Now the research that I've done shows that for countries to grow significantly, one of the prerequisites is that you need a very strong increase in the population growth rate. Having a strong increase in the working age population growth rate is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for causing high economic 
growth rates. Let me explain how this works. Uh, that if you look at it historically, the countries, let's say, that were able to grow at a pace of more than 6% a year for an entire decade, by any definition, that's a strong economic performance. 75% uh, of those countries that were able to grow at a rate of more than 6% a year for a decade, those countries had an increase in their working age population of at least 2% a year. So as you can see that uh, a 2% a year increase in the working age population was almost a necessary condition for achieving high economic growth rate, meaning a lot of people are coming uh, to the workforce, are joining the workforce. Now, of course, the opposite is not true. All because a country has a very high working age population does not mean that it will automatically generate high economic growth rate. In fact, of all the countries that have had a working age population growth rate of more than 2%, only 25% of those countries were able to convert that demographic dividend into uh, a meaningful economic performance, which is an economic growth rate of 6% a year for an entire decade. So you have many countries in the Middle East, in Africa, in Latin America, that consistently, uh, or countries like Philippines, uh, where consistently in the 70s or 80s, uh, and even, of course, India, that were not able to convert the massive increase in their demographics into a very high uh, uh, economic uh, growth rate. But the opposite is also uh, not, tr uh, uh, not true, which is that if you have low population growth rates, the probability that you can achieve a very high economic growth rate is practically uh, close to zero. There are hardly any countries in the world that have been able to grow when their population growth rate has not been increasing. So if you look at the case of India, uh, India's working age population growth rate uh, has been coming down quite significantly. 2% uh, is the magical number, as I said, that for countries to grow at a rate of 6% consistently, typically 2% increase in the working age population growth rate is what countries need. Uh, India had that 2% number right up until 2010. But after 2010, that number has been coming down. And currently, that number is just 1.5%. So India's working age population growth rate now is growing at just 1.5% a year. That number fell below 2%. So in many ways, that demographic sweet spot, when countries have a working age population of more than 2% a year, is over for India. It's, uh, it's now come down to 1.5% and is projected to keep declining, especially with the fall in the birth rates that we are seeing. Uh, and those are long leads and lags, but that's what we expect, that that, that is likely to come down uh, over the next uh, 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 few years or so. The birth rates in India, also the early evidence of the pandemic, is that the birth rates have come down uh, quite uh, significantly. So it really means that the probability that India will be able to grow at a rate of more than 6% on a sustained basis is declining quite sharply. Already over the last decade, India's economic growth rate was close to 7% as per the official data. I know there are lots of question marks about the data, but uh, it was close to 7%. So in, in, in some ways, India was already an exception to this rule over the last decade. But there's so much analysis as to why India can't grow uh, rapidly. And uh, you know, there's so much talk about not enough refund by the government, policy uh, not being that conducive. So many reasons are discussed for this but just not enough attention is paid to the fact that the demographics have changed in India and India's population growth rate is no longer conducive for producing very high economic growth rates. Uh, so this is something which I think has to be properly appreciated, but 
In economic terms, it is something which I think uh, people call the anchoring bias, which is that all because we were able to grow at seven, eight or nine percent. And we have many examples of other countries that were able to do that. We keep aspiring for that type of growth rate. But it is something which uh, we have to change our projection on and change our mindset on in terms of what is realistically the right growth rate as far as India is concerned. So demographics, as I said, is one half of the story. The other half of the story has to do with productivity. Let's turn our attention now to productivity, that what has been happening there, what are some of the other trends that are in play, and what does it mean in particular for India? So as I said, four Ds that have been defining the global economy have been accelerated by the pandemic. We just spoke about demographics. Let's now look at what's happening to productivity, declining productivity. That if you look at the uh, data, what it shows you is that the world's productivity growth rate has been declining for the last two or three decades. Uh, why that's the case, there are a whole host of reasons that have been uh, given for that. Uh, some of those reasons include that the technology that we are developing now is much more uh, consumer friendly, but not that productive, which is that a lot of the technology helps you sort of, you know, uh, play games, watch video. It's all uh, much more entertainment and leisure, but it's not the cutting edge kind of technology for business innovation. There are a lot of arguments about that, uh, but it is something obviously worth considering. Again, in the pandemic, given the fact that we had much increased digitization and we found new ways to work, we would have thought that the productivity data would show there's an increase in productivity that we have achieved during the pandemic. But the early readings currently suggest that there is no evidence that productivity has increased during the pandemic. In fact, the surveys show that more and more people have been working from home and they're working longer and longer hours, but their output has uh, not changed. In fact, their output has gone down a bit. So no real evidence has yet to suggest that productivity has increased significantly due to increased digitization. Then there are some other more uh, complex arguments as to why productivity may not have increased significantly during the uh, uh, pandemic, or in general, why was productivity declining even before the pandemic came through. Um, one of those has to do with the fact that there are a massive increase in the number of so-called zombie companies in the world, something which is eating away at the, the heart of capitalism. What do I mean by this? Well, what I mean by this is that uh, around the world now, the number of companies that are not able to earn enough profit to make their interest payments uh, in a particular year has been going up significantly. It's gone up very significantly, in fact, over the last uh, few years. The United States is a classic example. The number of zombie companies in the United States uh, back in the uh, 90s was just 2% of all the listed companies in the United States. The current estimates are that nearly 20% of all listed companies in the United States can be classified as zombie companies. Companies uh, which for nearly three years have not earned enough profit to uh, cover their interest expenses. And so they're forced to keep going to the market to borrow. And this is facilitated by the very cheap money policies that central banks and governments have pursued. Much easier for governments there uh, to keep supporting companies, but that also keeps a lot of deadwood alive out there. In India's case too, uh, the number of zombie companies uh, like is very high. Uh, by some measures, nearly one out of every three companies in India uh, have an interest coverage uh, 
of uh, of less than one. So you know the fact that they they just uh, don't have enough uh, profits that they're making to cover their interest uh, expenses. So I think that this is one of the fundamental problems with uh, what's become of capitalism that the that instead of allowing companies to fail allowing new companies to uh, to emerge at a rapid pace we are keeping alive a lot of dead wood companies out there because we are so scared to let any company fail because we're concerned of the contagion effects of it and in general the political pressure to keep alive uh, companies is quite considerable so our sort of ability to take any pain or any risk has gone down over time. This does not mean that no new companies come up. Of course they do. But it's the fact that the mix has shifted. The number of efficient companies uh, out there has become uh, uh, smaller and yet more concentrated and bigger. But because so many deadwood companies have been kept out there, it is not allowing new startups to come up at the uh, pace that they should be coming up with. Lots of new startups are coming up but not at the pace that these uh, companies should be coming up with. So a very significant uh, point here as well, which is that we have seen uh, a decline in productivity at a time when we should have been seeing an increase in productivity, given that we are living in the midst of such an incredible technological age. The arguments as to why we're seeing a decline in productivity range from the fact that the kind of technology that uh, we are developing today is much more consumer facing and uh, so uh, great for things like entertainment and leisure, but it's, it's not as cutting edge technologies in the past, which made a big difference to businesses, whether it was the steam engine or even air conditioning compared to those kind of innovations that we saw in the past, uh, uh, like out there. So that's one sort of sleeve of the argument. The other sleeve of the argument is that we are keeping alive a lot of deadwood companies. And that is why we are not seeing uh, uh, more startups and more productive companies come to the fore. So that was the second uh, trend in terms of declining productivity. The third trend, uh, which I uh, spoke about, which is sort of related to this has to do with debt, uh, that there is just so much debt in the system uh, out there. Uh, and this is a big change that's taken place. If you look at the global economy, the size of the global economy, I think that at the outset you mentioned about uh, the, that how the size of the global economy, $50 trillion at the start of uh, the 2000s, now it's $100 trillion. So the global economy has increased, but the amount of debt that the global economy is carrying with it has increased even faster. And this was not the case. Uh, uh, for many decades. In fact, right up until the 1980s, the level of debt in the global economy and the size of the global economy were roughly similar. Uh, and they were increasing at the same pace. But from the 1980s, as globally, you had much greater financial deregulation, much greater inter, uh, 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 financialization of the economy, and also lower and lower interest rates and easier and easier central bank policies, the amount of debt in the global system increased significantly to the extent that today, the amount of debt in the global economy is more than four, four times the size of the global economy, more than four times. Uh, as I said, that back in the 80s, the size of the global economy and the size uh, of the global debt were roughly si uh, similar. Now it is more than four times greater. And you know, when I started my <coughs> uh, investing career more than 25 years ago, there were virtually no countries in the world where the debt as a share of the economy was let's say more than 300%, virtually none. Today, there are more than 25 countries in the world, including some leading lights from US to China, <coughs> sorry, where the, you have the uh, debt to GDP ratio of more than 300%. So 
So the world has taken on a lot of debt to try and grow. And this goes back partly to my original point that because we all want to achieve very high economic growth rates uh, of the uh, uh, past, even though the demographics have shifted, the productivity has shifted, we're relying more and more on debt to try and achieve these very high uh, growth rates. So that uh, is like another reason as to why the pandemic has only made the situation worse because the amount of debt that the global economy took in the pandemic was of a different magnitude. Debt levels were going up, going up sharply, much higher than the pace of the global economy. But after the pandemic, the world economy has been on a debt binge, has taken on lots of debt. And remember that, <coughs> that there is no free lunch. There will always be some price to be paid for this debt. It may not be in terms of a crisis, but it may be in a more insidious way where the productivity of the economy declines because of the amount of debt that's taken place. And also, it favors the rich much more than the poor. It is an argument of inequality because the rich have much more access to finance, to debt, and <coughs> uh, it keeps them going much more compared to uh, the uh, other uh, segments of the economy. And like in India's case too, the total debt uh, as a share of the economy is uh, around 170% or so. So of course, not as high as the developed countries or even China, which are more than 300%, but for a country of, of India's per capita income level, a debt to GDP ratio of 170%. This includes everything. This includes government debt. We have a tendency of focusing too much only on government debt. I like looking at total debt numbers. What is the private sector? So in India's case, if you take like everything into account, it's about 170% or so. And for a country of India's per capita income level uh, of around $3,000 or so, that is a fairly high amount of debt that we have out there. Uh, and something which is likely uh, to keep the pressure, I think, on uh, real interest rates. So these are the three Ds, as I said, which were accelerated by the pandemic. Let me conclude by talking about the fourth D, and that has to do with deglobalization. Uh, now, what exactly is deglobalization? So for much of the post-war period, the world saw a period of very intense globalization, which is the trade in goods and services uh, exploded between countries. Capital flows exploded between countries. And so did people flows. You had a lot of migration that took place, uh, especially from the south to the north. Uh, but a lot of uh, connectivity in the world increased. Trade in goods and services exploded. Countries were able to grow exports very, very significantly in that period. So that I think uh, was a very important driver of economic growth in many emerging markets, uh, because it is very, very important for countries to be able to grow uh, uh, on the back of exports. Exporting your way to prosperity is the traditional model uh, for very high uh, economic growth. So we ended up seeing uh, a very significant increase in export growth in an, in an era of globalization. Uh, what does the data show us here? The data shows that typically when countries are grow rapidly at a rate of, let's say, more than 6% a year or, or 7%, more often than not, it is led by exports. That export growth tends to be more than 20% a year when countries are growing that uh, rapidly. So in an era of globalization, that was much easier to do because the trade in goods and services everywhere was increasing so, so uh, rapidly. But after the global financial crisis, we saw a much greater increase in protectionism. Uh, that we saw that a lot of countries became much more protectionist 
and the trade in goods and services stopped increasing. The trade in goods and services and the share of GDP in the global economy plateaued and started to decline after the global financial crisis, which makes it much more difficult for countries to export their way to prosperity, including for India. So the world's export growth, which in the boom years of the 2000s was more than 20% a year, in, uh, during the uh, 2010s, that virtually collapsed. It collapsed to virtually zero. Uh, and so that like, obviously made it much harder for the global economy uh, and for countries to grow very rapidly. Capital flows, something very similar happened. Capital flows as a share of GDP were growing at around 14, 15% a year during the boom years of 03 to 07. Uh, that also declined to uh, virtually uh, low single digit levels during the uh, uh, 2010s. Much greater migration uh, stops and flows as well took place uh, back in the, uh, in the 2010s. The only place where we did see a big explosion in terms of uh, cross-border flows was data flows, that the data flows increased a lot due to digitization. But even there now, we're seeing much greater data restrictiveness at least take place within borders, even as data flows are increasing sharply um, at home. But here, I think that at least the one good story is that what India has been able to do in terms of data flows and digitization is very significant. I've spoken about the headwinds to economic growth, whether it's demographics, it's debt, it's got to do with uh, declining productivity. But when it comes to data flows on this aspect of uh, that, that even though it's becoming more difficult with deglobalization, when it comes to data flows, I think, and it comes to digitization, India has done really well uh, over the last uh, few years. So if you look at India today, the digital revenues as a share of the economy, India, uh, in fact, ranks uh, around uh, uh, number 12 or 13 in the world, which is very significant because uh, the only other emerging market, which is there even in the top 15, is uh, China. Uh, so China clearly showed the way on how to uh, digitize very rapidly and grow very rapidly and offset you know, some of the other disadvantages it has now from its demographics and data are much more perilous than uh, any other country I know, uh, any large country I know, but it was able to offset some of that with the incre incredible amount of digitization. India, too, has been able to achieve a lot of success on this front over the last few years. As a result, the digital revenues as a share of the economy uh, in India today uh, is uh, increasing rapidly. In fact, digital revenues are growing by more than 30% a year in India, uh, far higher than most other countries in the world. A lot of that is happening because of e-commerce, and a lot of it is happening because of e-services as well. In fact, the increase in e-services in India is far higher than any country that I know in the world. So that is like the one advantage as far as India is concerned. But to conclude, what I'm trying to say here is this, and I think this is very important, and I think that this has to be understood by economists as well, that give up the anchoring bias. Stop talking about 8 9% type economic growth rates. Given the change in demographics and the other global headwinds that we have, there is going to be no country in the world that is going to be able to achieve those economic growth rates today. Uh, uh, and in, in doing so, you could end up making lots of policy errors as well. A much better sort of measure that I've said for economic uh, progress around the world could possibly be per capita income because it takes into account in the decline in population that's taking place out there. But to achieve 8 to 9% economic growth rate, given the situation of demographics, is very difficult. Also, given what's happening with deglobalization, trying to export your way to prosperity is going to be quite difficult as well. Having said that, India has been doing relatively better on that uh, phase with its exports shared in the global economy inching a bit higher. 
And the room for that is there because even though the pie is not increasing, there are countries which have been benefiting from China's uh, decline uh, or peak as an export powerhouse. And we've seen Vietnam, Bangladesh kind of countries uh, uh, benefit from that. But what India needs to focus on now has to be much more on the productivity side of the equation if we want to grow rapidly. And by rapid economic growth now, I mean that achieving economic growth rate uh, of, of anything in excess of 5% should be considered a very significant achievement given the other global headwinds out there, including the one of demographics and declining productivity and deglobalization uh, in the world. What India is doing on the digital front, I think is uh, very significant. The key here is for the state to be an enabler, uh, enabler of that and not to start coming in the way of that by putting in more restrictions uh, and like having a regulatory policy which is friendly for the growth of the digital economy. So in some ways, we have to keep into uh, account what has happened in the past, but in some ways, we have to look forward rather than be wedded to the past. There's a Russian proverb that I like a lot, which I uh, would like to like end with, which is that you ignore history, you lose an eye. You focus on it too much, you lose both. Uh, <laughs> so I think that that uh, what I've tried to do here is to keep the balance, which is to look at the historical trends. Where does India fit in on, uh, from a historical perspective? And also in terms of going forward, what could be the new path for growth as some of the traditional paths for growth uh, close out? And where does that opportunity lie for the country? Uh, with that, I'd like to conclude this lecture. Uh, I think I've been on time and open the floor to any questions. Thank you. Well done, Ruchir. Uh, very crisp. And in many respects, very reminiscent of the way Mr. Palkiwala used to speak. The highlights of Mr. Palkiwala's typical lecture would be the amount of statistics that he would bring to bear on discussing any of the points and uh, the kind of flow and logic and the sequencing, uh, the way in which you did is very reminiscent of the way Mr. Palkiwala used to do. Uh, very outstanding lecture and you have really triggered a lot of people and their anxiety and I'm seeing a kind of questions that are coming forth are reflective of that. I just want to uh, mention that there are some very interesting numbers about this particular event. You have just delivered the 40th Palkiwala Memorial Lecture in the 20th year after the passing of the great legend. And this is the 30th year after which the lecture that Mr. Palkiwala delivered in 1992, speaking on the budget of that year, which to my mind would stand out as one of the great budget speeches that he ever delivered. And I feel very lucky and fortunate that I could lay my hands on that particular speech. And I want to read out one particular paragraph, which will set the context for perhaps the first question. I now read from Mr. Palkiwala's budget speech, I quote, I have the highest opinion of Indian capacity and potential, but I find it impossible to refute the universal criticism that our two besetting sins are self-complacency and obstinate refusal to face the truth. We could have more realistically chosen the ostrich instead of the peacock as our national bird. The survey on India published by the economist of 4th May 1991 showed the tiger caged. It should be made compulsory reading in every school and college, as well as for those adults who choose to enter the parliament or the civil service. The jugular vein of this article is that if India has more than its fair share of the world's misery, it is not the fault of the colonial masters or wicked Western capitalists or the cruel hand of fate. It is largely India's own doing. We are slipping behind the rest of the world, except in population growth. This truth can be hardly better illustrated than by the fact 
present per capita income in south korea is 13 times and in hong kong 30 times that of india though all these countries started at about the same level i close the quotation now these two particular statistics today stand at south korea is about 15 times of india and hong kong is about 22 23 times depending upon how you calculate the per capita gdp so in some sense India has been running very fast to stay in the same place. We have not slipped too badly because from the time of 1992 to today, these equations don't seem to be uh, too very average. But there is perhaps some reasons as to why we could not accelerate and go beyond the growth rates which some of the other countries have achieved. So in this backdrop, there is a question which is fairly descriptive and it uh, sort of overlaps some of the points that you have covered in your lecture. But then in terms of making it holistic, I want to take two minutes to explain this question to you. And the anchor question has been raised by Mr. R. Seshasai, who is a very senior corporate personality in Chennai. And there are a few other supplementary comments and remarks that have come uh, based on your lecture, which also fills into this question. The primary issue is, what is the kind of economic model that India needs to follow in future? Taking into account the fact at which you very rightly emphasize that the sustained growth rate of 7 to 8% uh, is no longer easy. The uh, disadvantages that arise in future would be on demographic in terms of the population mix is changing. The export opportunities are coming down because it is going to become more regional and not global. And India has not had a great record in terms of regional uh, uh, trade. The third factor is that, which you very rightly emphasize, that capital is not going to be easily available once the borrowing levels have gone up. Commodity prices are uh, seesawing. India doesn't have too much control. It is influenced by countries like China. So there are many headwinds uh, which India faces. The most striking issue which one sees post-pandemic, since the emphasis is on post-pandemic world, is the kind of serious discrepancy in the way the wealth has been accumulating. Uh, the recent reports have uh, brought out the fact that India is perhaps faring worst in terms of the disparity in income and wealth. The greatest amount of wealth is going towards the uh, richer people. And there is some statistics which I don't want to mention for the fear of being hounded because I don't know how correct it is. From 2016, I think a very significant portion of the population has slipped into poverty. So these are very formidable issues, formidable aspects facing the economy. So in this context, assuming you are called tomorrow and the budget is just 15 days away and asked to give three good prescriptions of a new economic model for the country, uh, what would it be? I remember some time ago, whether it was you or George Soros who went to Moscow and gave a very truthful uh, account of the Russian economy in the presence of Vladimir Putin. And the next morning, you are shown the shortest route to the Moscow airport. So I don't think something like that will happen since you're sitting in Miami. But uh, you can be a little open about what you think are possibilities for India to achieve a reasonable rate of growth, which will actually make it more equitable rather than being very distortive as at present. Over to you, Rishi. Yeah, you know, like I've always been wary of giving policy prescriptions just because I know that... Uh, it makes me sound very self-important. Uh, but as I said that, you know, like uh, uh, in, in one good thing I will say that the government did do uh, is at least that it was realistic and spent within its means, which is the fact that it did not overstimulate the economy because, and this is something that I wrote about, which is that there was so much pressure, I guess, uh, you know, like, like on the government and governments around the world to go for maximum stimulus uh, to do that. And many of the developed countries did that. And my point was that it was not feasible for many emerging markets such as India to engage in these kind of policies. And the countries which did that, which is in terms of overstimulate, whether it was a Brazil or Turkey, et cetera, paid the price for that uh, in terms of the, by, by having to deal with macroeconomic instability after that. So I think that it is very uh, important for India to continue to maintain a conservative uh, 
relatively conservative, especially given the fact that we already have a pretty high public debt level, that it's important for us to maintain a relatively conservative macroeconomic framework. Uh, the other thing which I'd say is that never take the eye off the ball as far as inflation is concerned, uh, because nothing hurts the poor more than inflation. Uh, and I think that in this regard, I know that sometimes the corporate interests and the other interests sort of don't like this, but never ever take the ball, the ball as far as inflation is concerned. And it's also a political death wish. I mean, in India's case, we've done a lot of research on this. We don't know whether high economic growth leads to governments getting reelected or not. The evidence is quite mixed on that. But we do know that high inflation for sure kills a government's future prospects. So I'd say that in terms of keeping the, keeping the focus on fiscal discipline, not overstimulating, like uh, uh, the pressure is always there to do, uh, not taking the eye off the ball as far as inflation is concerned, and that challenge is, I think, likely to go up this year because we're seeing commodity prices pressure go up. India is still a large commodity importer. Uh, and the third thing I think is very important is you like to keep the focus on the digital economy. I, it's, it's, it's easy to get pessimistic about what cannot be achieved in an era of deglobalization, in an era of, uh, of declining demographics. But the potential that the digital economy brings for us, I think, uh, is, is already uh, evident out there and something on how do you keep facilitating that without the, you know, like the state becoming overbearing as uh, often tends to be the case in India. So I'd say that those are some of the priorities that I would say for any government uh, to keep in mind uh, out there. So yeah, in terms of uh, now, you know, now there are so many lists of cliches out there. We can talk about, uh, you know, like stuff like um, uh, how we should improve the law and order situation, the like the other things, but the other, but you know, there's no end to that. Uh, but the one other policy thing, which I think that, you know, that I did not speak about in the lecture, which I would sort of touch upon is also something needs to be done about this aspect of why is India's female participation in the labor force so low? Uh, because it's been declining, in fact, and it's one of the lowest in the world. Uh, and especially at a time when the demographic advantage uh, has sort of faded uh, in a way. Having you know much greater female participation in the labor force is something that policymakers need to think about. That why is it declining in India's case? Why is it so low? And how do we get that to augment the demographic uh, issue uh, issue that we have out there? So these are some of the uh, sort of steps that I think that the government needs to think about as it uh, uh, you know like in terms of its policy framework and you know the other thing i've spoken a lot about in my books also is about you know much more competitive federalism uh, that we keep looking at the center to do stuff but a lot of this has to be done from the other aspects of the uh, states as well uh, rather than just relying on the center to do stuff uh, a model of competitive and cooperative federalism is very important given india's polity uh, rather than making too many top down decisions from the center there was one more component to the question which I should have included, but I didn't want to overburden the question. See, this question is arising from the fact that India is making an effort to increase the content of manufacturing in the economy. And in that light has uh, brought in the scheme by which uh, there is a production linked incentives where the government you know, gives away uh, fiscal grants. And it has also brought down the tax rates to a very unrealistic 15% from an Indian point of view. These are big uh, sacrifices made by the FISC. Do you think these policies are well advised in the current uh, context or it should have been uh, handled by a better mechanism of, say, reducing the indirect taxes, which would have helped the poor? No, I think that, you know, like if India wants to compete with, you know, like the other nations, having a low corporate tax rate is very important. That's what Southeast Asia did. Like, uh, having a low corporate tax rate was very much an integral part of the East Asian economic model. Uh, so I think that that is something which needs to be done as far as India is concerned. Maha, would you like to chip in? Yeah. Um, thanks, Mr. Um, 
I want to take you away from the economic kind of questions that Ranganathan has asked, but maybe take you away from the speech that you gave uh, to something that you have written about earlier. You know, you wrote the book on democracy on the road and you talked about the election and so on. So one of the questions that I want to start with, and I'll come back to the economy related questions later. Do you think that the domination of caste-based politics seriously undermines parliamentary democracy? Yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of you know that's just a reality as far as India is concerned. Uh, so yeah, you know in terms of I don't think that it is about caste-based politics, so to speak. It's the reality of India. I mean, you know that's 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 what India is about. We have traveled across India, as you say, like in Democracy on the Road. That's what I really enjoyed doing. But also, it was a real learning as far as India is concerned. Uh, that that you just have that. Uh, uh, it's a reality uh, of India that we just can't uh, tend to wish away. Um, and uh, there, you know, there are a couple of states in India where caste plays a much lesser role, uh, as you know, in, in politics. Uh, I think you can argue that Tamil Nadu is one of them. You can argue that even a state like West Bengal, where the caste is, I mean, caste matters everywhere, but in terms of relative importance, it, it it don't matter as much anymore there. I'm just not sure if that has made a big difference uh, to anything in those uh, states because some other factor comes up to dominate politics uh, in those places. So I've just learned to live with this as a reality uh, of, 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 uh, of India. No, uh, I won't push you further on that because these days most of the... Uh... Changing configurations seem to be based on caste-based equations, but I'll leave it at that. The, the second question I have is, uh, uh, you know, you've talked about this digital uh, economy uh, and also in some sense the data flows and so on as a result of the, uh, I mean, uh, the current trends, but you have not touched on cryptocurrency. Uh, are there uh, any issues of regulation that you, uh, you think India as a nation should, because there are rumors about uh, complete stoppage of some of the uh, areas and so on. Do, uh, we, uh, you know, question I would really value your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, I just don't favor, you know, like any of these bans and too much regulation of this because I feel that if you, you know, like it's like playing whack-a-mole that you ban something here, something else will come up. Uh, yeah, like one of the findings I found really sort of remarkable is that today in the world, there are nearly... 8,000 cryptocurrencies. Uh, so a lot of attention is uh, comes because of Bitcoin uh, and then Ethereum after that, but you keep going down, there's something new or the other. This is the way of the future. I do feel there are some aspects of this having become too bubbly and there are too many of these cryptocurrencies and the price has gone up far too much, but this is a way of the future. In some ways also, it's a bit of a revolt against the massive amount of printing done by central banks around the world uh, that, and too much dependence on the US dollar, that the US dollar is the world's dominant reserve currency, but the Fed keeps printing so many dollars out there. So you need some alternative out there, uh, which is, you know, which is uh, what, you know, why you end up getting some cryptocurrencies rise and fill up the space. Uh, you know, one statistic I keep uh, sort of mentioning is that in the year 2020 of the of the pandemic of the massive stimulus, the uh, Fed printed more than 20 percent of all the dollars in circulation in the world just that year. Uh, so you know these are natural consequences. I mean, even in India, uh, the RBI did, uh, did a fair amount of new money issuance and printing in the year 2020. I think it was nine percent of all the rupees in circulation were printed just in the year 2020. So, um, you know, this is just a natural consequence of things. Uh, and I think that banning it is, uh, you know, just banning the symptom. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not going after, the, I mean, the real cure. Uh, and I think that, so cryptocurrencies is here to stay. Uh, even if the prices are a bit inflated now and the number of uh, currencies is a bit too large, but it's here to stay and banning it is like playing whack-a-mole. Something else will come up. Right. And I'd like to ask one more question, short one. Uh, this is, you know, you have talked about these debt and you have, in fact, quite summing up, you have talked about 
you know, not being responsible in this is not a good idea and so on in terms of additional debt. But, the, you know, in the economic survey of 2021 in India, a new discussion surfaced that the sustainable debt levels for a country is dependent on the growth versus interest rate equation. Um, if growth exceeded interest rate, then borrowing to grow is a good strategy, is what it says. Although you have talked about this 175 percent, uh, do you see a fundamental flaw in this uh, thinking? No, I'd say that in terms of that, you know, like you can increase your debt level, and I, and you know, what these economic equations that you are citing, these are about debt sustainability ratios. But you know, these can change very quickly. I mean, if interest rates go up for some reason or there's a loss of confidence among investors or, or, you know, like if inflation goes up too much, these equations can change very quickly. Uh, so, I mean, I'd say that my own research shows that it's not the level of debt which matters as much, but the pace of increase. That if you have a very sharp increase in the level of debt, you're bound to make mistakes by making bad loans for bad projects. So focus on the pace of increase rather than just the level as well. The level matters to tell you what the state is, but I think the pace of increase matters even more. So if you have a very sharp increase in the pace, a country almost always gets into trouble. Uh, it's a rule that I spoke extensively about in my books called the kiss of debt, that, you know, that it's not the level so much, but the pace of increase. You get a sharp increase in the, in the pace over any five-year time horizon, you're bound to make mistakes and make bad loans. Thanks, Mitchell. I'll pass it on to Raghunathan if he has any more questions. Uh, maybe I'll just burden you with one more. I'm uh, very conscious of the fact that we have slightly overshot the time commitment that we gave to you. Uh, this is more to um, give a takeaway to many of the people who have tuned in today. While uh, there is definitely worries about the world economics and the country economics, people are also worried about their personal economics. So, uh, in the in the opportunity that we have of uh, listening to one of the greatest global investors, people would like to know, uh, assuming somebody approached you with $10 million and asked you where to invest, what would you suggest in terms of country, class of asset, commodity, and currency? All right. You really put me on the spot here with a global asset allocation decision to make uh, out there. But I'd say that my general observation is that this is going to be a good decade for commodities uh, because of the fact that the supply for commodities has been severely constrained and yet demand is going to remain out there. I generally feel that emerging markets are going to do relatively better than, let's say, the United States. I mean, one of the big disconnects in the world today is that the United States has done really well financially over the last decade in a way that we I think underappreciate the U.S. economy today is about 25 percent of the global economy, and yet the uh, U.S. stock market today is 60 percent of the global stock markets in terms of its value. Uh, and emerging markets is the other way around. You have countries like India and all part of the emerging markets. So emerging markets are about 35 percent of the global economy, but as, as the share of the market value they're just above 10%. So I'd say that in terms of, I would put more money in emerging markets, I would put more money towards commodities, uh, and I would expect interest rates to somewhat head higher or, uh, over the next few years, and I would allocate capital accordingly. Uh, so uh, uh, yes, I do feel that the Indian stock market uh, over the next five to 10 years uh, will do relatively well along with other emerging markets. Uh, now, if the US interest rates were to go up, obviously some of the returns would be curtailed, uh, but I feel in general more constructive about uh, uh, allocating capital that way. And that's very different. But I think the very important thing here is that there is no standard formula. A decade ago, when I wrote my first book, Breakout Nations, the basic thesis of that book was that the BRICS were in general overhyped, and the true breakout nation in the world was the United States. I wish I had invested my money and my career accordingly. Uh, but a decade later, I would suggest uh, doing something which is the opposite of that, which is what I've just laid out. 
So I have been very discreet in not bringing the fifth C into the discussion, which is the company, because that would be very unfair to ask you in a public forum. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. you have delivered a great answer to the question, which was actually raised by Mukund Raghavan, uh, management consultant from Bangalore. Excellent uh, uh, Q&A responses, Ruchir. Uh, we are extremely happy the way you have gone about. Within a short time, you have just done tremendous justice to the entire discussions. And may I now hand it over to senior advocate Arvind Dutta. Arvind, you are on mute. Sorry, I was just li- listening to him with rapt attention for the entire talk. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. You summarized it very nicely in the four Ds. And I think the fifth D was, this is a delightful lecture. And <laughs> I think that <laughs> I-, I would thank the entire, the large audience who's gathered on a Sunday evening to listen to you. It just shows your popularity and how much people follow you that people have uh, logged in in such large numbers on a Sunday evening. Now, this lecture would not have been possible without the team effort of so many people. And it's my pleasant duty to wind up by proposing a vote of thanks. First of all, first thanks to you, Ruchi Sharma, for for accepting our invitation, speaking across several continents. You're in Miami. And despite the time zone, you've been kind enough to give this wonderful lecture. We can note that a lot of preparation has gone into it and it's given tremendous value for the entire audience here. I must thank Durga, Dr. Durga Lakshmi and the team at the Palkiwala Foundation. They have been absolutely working tirelessly to make this lecture a great success. To Offbeat Music Ventures for their back-end technical support, they've been great. Thank you so much. To the Hindu Group of Publications and Business Line for their print media support to the New Indian Express and Deccan Chronicle for the print media support. I must mention that for the first time, we've had so many write-ups about your article, raising really the expectations from the entire audience. Uh, special request to the other print and thanks to the other print and social media. Special thanks to CNBC team for their TV support. And of course, thanks to corporate leaders, businessmen and general public. And I think the biggest thank must go to our entire audience for being uh, for participating in our lecture. And I hope, uh, Ruchi Sharma, that you continue your association with the Palkiola Foundation in the years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruchi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. The meeting is concluded. <laughs>